Boom! An explosion of supersonic waves, interplanetary heat, dust, fumes. The Earth's atmosphere has been invaded by a cosmic rock the size of Everest. A few seconds ago, this rock, weighing trillions of tons, was hurtling towards Earth. It could fly from New York to Anchorage faster than you could fry yourself an omelet. This monster's name? The Chicxulub Incident. Epic name, right? 66 million years ago, it crashed into the Earth. Back then, dinosaurs ruled the planet, but not for long. The epic collision took place in modern Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula right near Cancun, where the dinosaurs were vacationing. Well, probably not. Still, the huge space rock hit the ocean, but even all that water couldn't stop the inevitable. The collision caused a huge amount of energy to be released. The horror on a planetary scale had begun. Imagine a mini-sun lighting up the surface of the Earth with tsunamis the height of the Statue of Liberty bursting from the epicenter of the watery impact. Hmm, not good. The blast blew through the surface of the Earth. It was as hot as an oven and burnt everything in its path. The impact provoked a colossal earthquake and serious volcanic activity. A bunch of volcanoes simultaneously released hot lava and ash into the prehistoric skies. Millions of tons of ash and soot poisoned the air. This formed a huge ash cloud in the atmosphere, which blocked out the sun's rays for several years. The long winter had begun. Only there wasn't any snow falling from the sky, but rain made of sulfuric acid. Yes, the Chicxulub incident might just be the most important thing that ever happened in the history of our planet. Even more than YouTube. Back then, there were loads of volcanic eruptions, a lot of flammable oxygen in the atmosphere, constant temperature changes. It was the perfect and worst time for all of this to go down. So, how are we so sure about all this? Well, the asteroid left an absolutely huge crater on the planet's surface. Today, this scar is hidden under the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists found a lot of places on Earth with abnormally high levels of iridium. This metal is very rare on Earth, but it's in a lot of asteroids that scientists have examined. Scientists studied some 66 million year old rocks. In the layers of rock, they found dust, the same dust that comes from asteroids. This could only have happened if a huge asteroid had crashed into Earth. The catastrophe led to the extinction of not only the dinosaurs, but also the asteroid. It was so hot at the point of impact part of the asteroid just disappeared. A lot of water vapor and carbon dioxide shot up into the atmosphere. But the biggest problem? Sulfur. It got kicked up by the asteroid impact and flew up into the air. These tiny sulfur particles blocked out a lot of the sun's rays. Without the sun, a lot of plants disappeared and the climate eventually got colder. The immense heat turned stones into glass. Scientists call these things tectites. The energy of the impact threw them up into the skies. After a short flight, the tectites fell down to Earth. But it wasn't pretty. Rain fell too. Only instead of drops of water, you'd have seen hot glassy fireballs. They bombarded the planet's surface for days. The tectites set fire to everything. Scientists found evidence of this all over the world, not just near the collision site. But a lot of things from back then are still a mystery. Some scientists think that Chicxulub wasn't even an asteroid. It might have been a comet. Asteroids are mostly made of stone and metal. Most often, they kind of look like a potato. A comet contains rock, metal, and ice. Comets look like dirty cosmic snowflakes, complete with ammonia, methane, and carbon dioxide. Comets sometimes come from the Oort cloud. It's a huge cloud of ice and debris around our solar system. From time to time, comets break free from the pack and head towards our Sun. According to scientists, this special comet flew right past Jupiter. The gravity of that huge planet accelerated the comet even more. It flew towards the Sun, gaining more and more speed. The comet's outer ice shield started to evaporate, and it probably gave off a lot of dust and gas, which made it look like it had a tail. The Sun's gravity eventually shattered the comet apart. One of the fragments flew through space and crashed into the Earth 66 million years ago. So, asteroid or comet? The truth is, we'll never know. 
What we do know is that the Earth was seriously unlucky to be in its path, and it was never the same again. The catastrophe stopped the development of 75% of life on Earth. Some bigger marine animals, like crocodiles, turtles, and fish, survived the impact. Out of all land animals, the only ones to survive were the ones that were, on average, smaller than the modern raccoon. That includes a bunch of special species of dinosaurs, the ancient ancestors of birds. Scientists believe they survived for two reasons. After the huge impact, it took a long time for plants to start growing again. And a lot of animals didn't survive. Most remaining animals didn't have enough food. But these dinosaurs had a beak. With its help, they could split open nuts and dig seeds out of the soil. So they survived. The second reason is that these lucky guys had bigger brains. Some people think that they were able to cooperate with each other and quickly adapt to the new conditions. Other life forms survived too. Fungi and mold survived underground and underwater. Gradually, the darkness cleared away, and ferns began to take over the lifeless landscape. After a few thousand years, forests started to reappear. The animals that survived were pretty much all inconspicuous and small creatures. They lived in burrows, safe from all that hot ash. Before the collision, mammals had lived in the shadow of dinosaurs. But with all the dinosaurs suddenly gone, things were about to change. Mammals were able to take over. They began to dominate life, at least on land. Back to the moment when everything changed. Turns out, it wasn't the size of the asteroid that made it so powerful. It was more about the angle in which it hit the Earth. If the angle of impact had been different, the dinosaurs might have even survived the catastrophe. So, what would that have looked like? Well, let's travel back. Way back. Oh no, there's a giant asteroid heading for Earth. Ah. Oh, wait, never mind, it missed. There are plenty of earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions every day, but dinosaurs don't mind that much. No big deal. Fast forward a few million years, and most of these ancient lizards have changed and are now unrecognizable. Thanks to a couple of ice ages, many dinosaurs are now totally covered with feathers to protect them from the cold. Mammals exist, but they're few and far between. You see a lot of bats in caves. There are tons of rat-sized rodents in the forests. During the day, they hide in the undergrowth or in burrows. At night, they go out in search of food. There are no horses, no elephants, or other large mammals. Why become large and eatable when there are so many dangerous reptiles with huge fangs around? There are no whales in the sea. Parrots, hawks, and pigeons are nowhere to be seen. But pterodactyls 2.0 whiz past you constantly. Some are about the size of a helicopter, while others are no larger than a swan. There are plenty of primates, but they're in no hurry to climb down from their trees and walk on two legs. No venturing out into the savanna, no evolution into Homo sapiens. In this alternate reality, open spaces are very dangerous. But then again, so are forests and trees. Nowhere is safe. To get some delicious primate treats, many smaller dinosaurs learned to climb trees. This was already happening back in the Cretaceous period, right before that huge asteroid just missed Earth. Whew! That would have been an epic collision. Dinosaurs have grown wiser since that near miss. Some are even as smart as a modern chicken. A large brain uses a lot of energy, and that's not always a good strategy for survival. Safer to keep brains small and keep making those teeth bigger and pointier. Big herds of dinosaurs run through the forest. The temperature rises rapidly and everything behind them begins to ignite. Some dinosaurs get stuck in swamps and can't get out. Pterodactyls fly over their heads as they try to avoid the blast wave that will soon cover the Earth. This event happened about 66 million years ago. It wiped out almost every living thing on Earth. Birds and flying dinosaurs were just about the only ones who could survive the most massive extinction event ever. Hey, don't blame me, I wasn't around then. Let's go down their evolutionary tree to look at the world's first bird, Archaeopteryx. It was about the size of a modern raven, but it looked like a small dinosaur with feathers. It had many small conical teeth, almost like alligators. It's because Archaeopteryx was closer to reptiles than to birds. 
However, its brain was three times larger than that of these reptiles. Although it had wings with feathers, it could hardly fly like modern birds. Its shoulder joints didn't allow it to lift its wings above its back, so it couldn't make a full wing beat. Most likely, Archaeoteryx was capable of gliding flights with small wing flaps. Evolution has led to more evolved species capable of full flight. Pterodactyls. These guys had no feathers, but membranes made of skin and muscle. Its wingspan was about the length of a human leg. It could fly perfectly and catch fish and small animals. Although flying dinosaurs could easily outrun terrestrial predators like velociraptors and T-rexes, most of them didn't make it through the impact of a giant meteorite. Let's look at this event step by step to see how they got to our time. 10 minutes before the meteorite crash. A massive rock about the size of Manhattan Island is moving towards Earth in space. It weighs 460 trillion tons. That's like 3 trillion blue whales, the heaviest mammals that ever lived on Earth. And it's approaching our planet at 12 miles per second. At that speed, it could cross the Atlantic Ocean in just 4.5 minutes. That's twice as fast as our modern spacecraft could fly. 5 seconds before the meteorite crash. Ooh, this is getting tense. The Earth's gravitational force continues to pull the giant meteorite. It blows a hole in our atmosphere and creates a popping sound so loud you could hear it on the other side of our planet. All the animals on our planet wake up in a panic. They lift their heads up and see a huge rock that begins to burn through the air. Smaller fragments start to break away from the main meteorite. This fire is so bright that it shines almost like the sun. Flying dinosaurs and other ancestors of modern birds are the first to sense danger. They make a beeline to the sky and try to fly as far away from the impact site as possible to save their lives. The moment of impact. The colossal mass and velocity of the meteorite give it an enormous amount of energy. As soon as it touches the Earth, it causes an explosion of 150 trillion tons of TNT. The blast wave literally rips out chunks of our planet and throws them up. A huge wall of energy begins to move from the point of impact in all directions. It snatches the trees out with their roots and pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The shock wave completely wraps around our planet. This energy turns into heat. Everything around the impact site begins to ignite. Green jungles and trees turn into smoldering charcoal in seconds. The ground and rocks simply evaporate. The collision caused a massive earthquake. Some dinosaurs may have fallen into cracks that appeared in the ground. A strong earthquake caused a tsunami, with waves higher than the Empire State Building. Dinosaurs that weren't trapped in the burning forest were washed away by the enormous waves. The dinosaurs of North America tried to escape by running to the north, but the blast wave inevitably catches up with them. Flying dinosaurs have no problem with earthquakes or tsunamis. They fly high enough to avoid the giant waves but they will have to contend with continuously falling meteorite debris. Five minutes after the meteorite crash. A meteor shower of giant rock fragments continues to fall to Earth. Some meteorites were the size of a car. Others were more like a large building. Ashes and dust rise into the air. Their temperature is so high that they melt and turn into liquid lava and then fall back to Earth, causing more fires. Meteor showers cause trouble for flying dinosaurs, too. They have to maneuver and dodge the falling red-hot rocks. The high temperatures are a huge problem for them because it might make them lose feathers. With no feathers, they aren't able to fly. 10 hours after the meteorite crash. The dinosaurs continuously ran north all this time. They found themselves in unfamiliar territory with many swamps. Giant dinosaurs like T-Rexes have legs as long as an adult human's height. They have a chance to get through this terrain. But if they fell, they could never get back up. The smaller dinosaurs, like Triceratops, had short legs and couldn't grow through the dense swamps. One month after the meteorite crash. 15 trillion tons of ash were ejected into our atmosphere. A dark cloud blocked the sun, and the Earth was immersed in complete darkness. Surviving plants couldn't feed on the sun's energy and stopped producing oxygen. Surviving dinosaurs could hardly breathe because of the lack of air and a large amount of dust. The lack of sunshine in the sky made photoplankton disappear. Many marine animals were left without their only source of food. The dust and ashes in the atmosphere prevent our planet from getting heat from the sun, and the temperature here is beginning to drop. The place where the meteorite fell was rich in sulfur. This toxic acid evaporated at the time of the impact and formed in clouds. Now there are acid rains on Earth. Flying dinosaurs now have to hide from these rains. 
They have to stay in caves and can't go outside to get some food. So far, a large number of terrestrial and flying dinosaurs have survived. They come out to see the aftermath of the disaster. The site of the impact was in present-day Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. The Chicxulub Crater is located here. It's about 93 miles wide, like half of all of Lake Michigan. And it's 12 miles deep. You could plunge the whole Mount Everest in there, and there would still be 6.5 miles of available space. It wasn't the impact itself that made the dinosaurs disappear. The fire destroyed most of the plants the herbivorous dinosaurs ate. With no food, their numbers dwindled rapidly. Predatory dinosaurs had nothing to eat either. Acid rain and the disappearance of photoplankton threatened all marine life. Even though birds managed to avoid the blast waves and tsunami, they were short of food too. About 80% of all birds didn't make it to the end of the extinction event. The problem was that all of the forests on Earth were wiped out. Most birds would nest and live in trees. Besides that, the forests were always full of food, from all kinds of ants and termites to flying insects and small mice. So only those species that lived on the ground and could fly well survived. Most likely, they fed on the seeds of small surviving plants. This habit made flying dinosaurs lose their teeth during evolution. Instead of jaws with a bunch of sharp teeth, they got long beaks to grab tiny seeds from the ground. Although Earth looks like a terrible place to live now, there's an evolutionary boom for birds. They have to travel long distances in search of food. Their wings get stronger. They also feel safe from predators who regarded them as food before. No T-Rex now catches a sleeping bird off guard. About a thousand years after the collision, the first dense forests appear. It gives another boost to evolution. A million years later, forests full of food are populated by the ancestors of modern mouse birds. And 65 million years later, in modern times, we have about 10,000 species of birds. Pigeons, crows, eagles, and hawks, even penguins. These are all descendants of the dinosaurs. But there were other survivors. Some alligator and crocodile ancestors were able to adapt to changing conditions. About 80% of turtle species managed to survive the mass extinction, and now their descendants live among us. Snakes and lizards were also able to wait out the hard times in their burrows. Even some mammals, like monotremes, survived. This hedgehog-sized animal was able to continue to evolve. Many millions of years later, these mammals evolved into primates, which later gave life to modern humans. Much, much later came the iPhone. Well, guess what? Blue Origin, the company owned by Jeff Bezos, has sent dinosaur bones to outer space. Can you believe it? Why? Well, it's all part of their Dream Big initiative to inspire people, especially students, to reach for the stars. On April 14, 2021, they launched almost 200 pieces of dinosaur bones into space using their new Shepard rocket. These bones are super old, like between 66 million and 70 million years old. They were fragments from a dinosaur called a Dromaeosaurus, which was part of a raptor family. It was kind of like a bird, but also a fierce hunter. It was about 7 feet long and had sharp claws on its feet. These guys were really good at hunting and slicing into their prey, do you think? Can you imagine how cool it would be to see a real dinosaur like that? The bones were carefully packed into a small container that was about 4 inches long. Then, on April 14th, they launched into space on a test flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. The rocket went 65 miles above the ground, which is a little above the point where Earth ends and space begins. The dinosaur bones were in space for about 10 minutes and 10 seconds. Alongside them were more than 25,000 postcards from members of the Club for the Future, which is a special group that Blue Origin created to inspire future generations. There was also a test dummy named Mannequin Skywalker <laughs> on the flight to collect data. Once the dinosaur bones came back from their trip to space, they were put on display. Each of them was carefully placed and shown to people who are part of the Club for the Future, as well as in museums all around the country. But you know what's even more surprising? This wasn't the first time dinosaur bones went into space. In the past, NASA astronauts also took fossils on their mission. Back in 1985, a piece of a baby dinosaur's vertebrae and an eggshell flew on NASA's space shuttle Challenger. And in 1998, a 210-million-year-old skull went on to space on another shuttle called Endeavour. 
they must have had quite an adventure up there. I don't know, do fossils have fun anymore? Oh, and don't forget about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yep, even parts of a T-Rex were sent into space in 2014 on NASA's Orion spacecraft. I bet those bones were really big and scary looking. But, surprisingly, this is not the only strange thing we've sent into space. In fact, a lot of our weird stuff has been there. For example, back in 2018, Elon Musk, the guy behind SpaceX and Tesla, did something totally wild. He sent his own shiny red Tesla Roadster into space. But that's not all. Inside the car, there was a dummy dressed in a spacesuit, and they named him Starman. How cool is that? Originally, the plan was to put the car in orbit around Mars, but something unexpected happened. The car went way past Mars and got stuck going around the sun instead. Can you imagine driving a car around the sun? It takes almost 560 days for the car to complete one lap. It's almost a two-year-long trip. As of June 2023, they have completed more than three and a half orbits around the sun and have traveled over two and a half billion miles. That's like going around the Earth over 100,000 times. The car has definitely gone above and beyond its normal driving limits. What's that they say about your mileage may vary? Unfortunately, Starman doesn't send us any new pictures anymore. It's been a while since we heard from him. Scientists think that both the car and the dummy passenger may have suffered some damage during their cosmic adventure. But, oh well, it was inevitable. It's space after all. Now, another strange thing that will be launched into space is the president's hair. Yep, you heard that right. On President's Day 2023, a company called Celestis made an unusual announcement. They're going to send some famous president's hair into outer space. Hair samples from George Washington, John Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, and Ronald Reagan were carefully collected and verified. This precious presidential hair will then be placed on the Enterprise spacecraft, which is going to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida, sometime in the summer of 2023. But wait, that's not all. The spacecraft won't just carry president's hair. It will also have remains of other important people. One of them will be Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. Some of his ashes were sent into space before, back in 1997, on Celeste's first flight. Well, I guess some of his remains still remain for a second trip. Now, here's the best part. The Enterprise spacecraft will not stay close to Earth. Oh no! It'll have a grander destination. It's set to travel beyond the farthest reaches of our solar system. It's going on an incredible journey into the unknown, from hair to eternity. Prices starting at $12,500 and up. But it's not as cool as a space party. Back in January 2018, something totally funky happened. Rocket Lab, an aerospace company, secretly sent a giant disco ball into space. They named it the Humanity Star, and boy, was it a sight to see. This massive mirror was about three feet wide and covered in 65 shiny panels. It spun rapidly as it orbited around our beautiful planet, reflecting sunlight back to Earth. It was so bright that you could even spot it without a telescope. The Humanity Star was like a dazzling reminder of how delicate and special our place in the universe is. But here's the sad part. The disco ball's time in space was short-lived. It came back down to Earth's atmosphere on March 22nd, just two months after it launched. That was way earlier than expected. Guess the party had to end sooner than they thought. Now here's a fun fact. Just like with dinosaurs, the Humanity Star wasn't the first disco ball to make its way into space. Starshine Project launched three similar shiny objects between 1999 and 2001. One of those groovy satellites, Starshine 3, stayed up in space for over a year. And let's not forget about Japan's mirror-covered satellite called Ajisei, launched in 1986, which is still up there orbiting Earth today. Humans sure love to send disco balls into space, huh? Well, scientists also have a sense of humor. So, prepare for some interstellar monkey business. Sometimes astronauts like to dress up as animals while in space. Back in 2016, an astronaut named Mark Kelly had a hilarious plan. He smuggled a full-body gorilla suit to his twin brother Scott, who was staying on the International Space Station. Can you imagine a gorilla floating around in space? Well, it happened. There's even a video that went viral. 
Scott surprised another astronaut, Tim Peake, from the United Kingdom by chasing him through the different modules of the ISS while wearing the gorilla suit. And here's the twist. Tim Peake was actually in on the joke, so it was all a good-natured prank. Now here's a funny backstory. Mark Kelly had actually tried to send the gorilla suit to Scott in 2015. He hit it on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, but sadly, the rocket went up in flames shortly after liftoff. Talk about bad luck for a gorilla suit. But do you know what item had better luck? The famous lightsaber from Star Wars, wielded by none other than Luke Skywalker himself. In 2007, a team of astronauts had a special mission. Alongside assembling the Harmony module on the International Space Station, they brought along Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. It was a tribute to the iconic movie series that inspired so many space lovers. The launch coincided with the 30th anniversary of the first Star Wars film, A New Hope. Fun fact, this lightsaber was Luke's second one, a cool green laser sword from Return of the Jedi. So these are the weirdest things we've sent into space. Next time you gaze up at the night sky, remember it's not just planets and stars out there. It's a cosmic playground filled with strange and wonderful objects from our very own Earth. And who knows what peculiar items we'll venture into space next. You're picking some veggies in the garden. When you come across something big and round, it's covered in soil. When you dig it out, you find out it's a giant egg, bigger than one of an ostrich. But you don't have any chickens or ducks. And even if you did, none of those animals could lay an egg of that size. You pick it up. It seems real. You take the egg inside and build an incubator for it. A couple of days pass, but nothing. You go on with your life and forget about the egg's existence. You've been working in your garden all day long. All you want now is to get into a tub filled with hot water and have some dinner later. But while you're eating, you hear some noise coming out of the room with the incubator. You ignore it, thinking it's just some mice scampering around. But then the sound intensifies. You head there and see the eggshell cracking. In a couple of minutes, something begins to crawl out. You grab your phone and immediately start filming it. A tiny reptile pokes out of the now broken egg and starts examining its surroundings. You're shocked. You place your phone on a special platform to keep filming the creature. Meanwhile, you grab your laptop and begin researching what animal it could be. The creature doesn't have the snout of an alligator, nor does it look like a Komodo dragon. You go back to your dinner and feed the reptile some leftover meatloaf. It gulps the food down in a flash. The next day, you build a small terrarium to keep an eye on your new pet. Over the following weeks, you record every second of its life. You call the reptile Buster. The creature has already grown to the size of a dog. It runs fast and jumps pretty high too. You think it might be some new reptile species, but it doesn't crawl like an alligator or a lizard. Your pet has two tiny arms and large legs. Its jaws are massive for an animal its size. The reptile also has razor sharp teeth. Your friend comes over for a movie. At one point, your reptile runs into the living room and starts biting the furniture. Your friend freaks out and starts yelling, DINOSAUR! You calm him down and take the dino to the garage. You explain to your friend how you found the animal, and he tells you to contact someone to examine it. The next day, you take Buster to the vet and take a seat in the waiting room. You keep your pet in a cage so that no one can see it. But the dino starts growling in a strange way. Many people grab their pets and move away from you. It's finally your turn. You bring Buster in and show it to the veterinarian. The man looks shocked. He puts the creature on a metal examination table and starts looking closely at its features. Sharp teeth and claws, scaly skin. The vet tells you you've been raising a T-Rex for three weeks. He calls in other specialists to examine the animal. The next thing you know, you're in a lab with a bunch of scientists studying Buster. You sit there anxiously as they collect its DNA samples. They even ask for the footage you've been recording. After a couple of hours, they come back and tell you that you indeed have a dinosaur. They'll have to keep Buster in the lab to conduct further studies. So you go home feeling a bit lonely. A couple of years pass. Now you have a degree in paleontology specializing in T-Rexes. 
You've been working with the lab and monitoring Buster that has turned into a fully grown dino. You also teach at the university and have published a book called My T-Rex Buster. It has become a bestseller. One day, you come back from the university and turn on the TV. That's when you hear breaking news. A large creature has broken out of a lab outside the city. It's now on the loose. They show several images of the beast's footprints that lead to the forest. You get a call from the lab. They ask you to head down there as fast as you can. The researchers tell you what's happened and ask you to accompany them to the forest to find the dino. You put on a special protective suit and get into a jeep. After a couple of hours, you arrive at the spot where Buster was last seen. You get out and try to follow its footprints, but the rain has removed the marks the creature left almost completely. The scientists check the tracking device placed under the dino's skin, but it's not working. They bring some food Buster likes to try to lure it out. After a couple of hours, there's no news. It's already night when you hear some rumbling in the distance. Everyone jolts awake. People around you are on high alert. You hide and wait. A large shadow the size of a school bus appears from the dark. A fully grown T-Rex can reach 40 feet long and 12 feet high. The giant lizard approaches the meat and sniffs it. After a couple of moments, it runs off. Everyone gets out of their hiding places and tries to follow the animal. The meat has a special substance in it. It was supposed to put the dino to sleep. This way, it wouldn't be a problem to bring it back to the lab. But the dino was smart enough to feel something suspicious. Despite its size, the T-Rex is quite slow. It can move at a speed of only 12 miles per hour and can't even outrun a human. But Buster somehow manages to cross a raging river and disappears into the dark forest. No one has been prepared to make it through such an obstacle, so the whole team makes a detour through the mountains. It's a difficult climb, with everyone carrying the equipment needed to catch the T-Rex. From the height of the mountain, you can see almost all the forest. Far away, treetops are shaking. The giant reptile is heading to the north. Everyone tries to get to the other side of the mountain as fast as they can. But then, one of the crew members slips and falls. Good thing a safety rope holds her in place. You pull the woman back to the path. You continue walking until you reach a cave. Everyone puts on their helmets with flashlights and goes inside. The deeper you go into the cave, the smaller it gets, so you have to crawl to get through. The rocks are sharp, and there's water everywhere. It's easy to get lost in here. The cave starts trembling. Everyone rushes to get through the narrowest part. You finally make it out of the cave. That's when you find out that the cave was trembling because of the T-Rex. It was stomping around the mountain. It spots your group and starts running towards you. People panic and rush back into the cave. The T-Rex catches up with your team and tries to snatch someone. But by that moment, everyone is already safely tucked inside the cave. Suddenly you scream, Buster! Shockingly, it seems to calm the creature down. You step outside, even though everyone is trying to hold you back. You get outside and face the massive creature. It's just staring at you. You slowly approach it, trying not to make any sudden moves. Someone from inside the cave gasps. It startles Buster. It starts thrashing and roaring, but you are still there, trying to calm the animal down. Eventually, it gets quieter and comes closer. You put your hand on its head, caressing it. After a few seconds, someone inside the cave steps on a twig and it cracks. The T-Rex jolts and runs away. You're furious. Now, you have to track it once again. After you spend many more hours in the forest, the sun starts to rise. Everyone is exhausted and about to pass out. You decide to call it a day and head back home. But as soon as your team gathers near the jeeps, you receive a notification that a giant T-Rex has entered the city. A helicopter picks up you and the other team members. There isn't enough room for everyone, so several people stay behind, waiting for the next chopper. The T-Rex is dashing through traffic. People in the streets are running for their lives. Dozens of news companies are filming the incident. Many people are posting it on social media. The dino breaks into the mall and destroys everything it sees. Your helicopter lands and you get out, trying to think of a way to calm the creature down. You rush into the mall, but the T-Rex has already run away to the other side of the building and managed to escape. You're following it, but suddenly you get a phone call saying that the team members left behind in the forest have spotted your T-Rex. 
You can even see the live footage of the animal. That means there are two giant reptiles on the loose in your state. We've all been afraid of the dark at some point in our lives, haven't we? I mean, do you remember getting tucked into bed by your mom or dad after they read you some scary fairy tale with monsters and dragons or even dinosaurs? But just as your parents were about to turn the lights off and silently step out of your room, you remembered. What if there was something hiding under your bed? Or worse, what if some spooky creature was stuck somewhere in the closet? You could probably get up and check, but it was too dark out there. Wouldn't it be great to have some source of light that would come from within your body? You could always use it whenever you get surrounded by darkness. Unfortunately, as humans, we aren't able to do that. But there are a bunch of creatures out there that can, in fact, light themselves up. That's thanks to a little something scientists call bioluminescence. Animals and fish living in the ocean tend to have this talent more often than others. And you can find these creatures anywhere close to the surface or deep down at the bottom. 2.5 miles deep if you have a knack for numbers. These creatures use their light for a lot of things, like communicating with other members of their species, luring in prey, and even scaring away enemies. Bioluminescence is basically an organism's ability to emit its own light. Chemistry has a lot to do with it. Such animals use two chemicals, one called luciferin, and the other called luciferase. Add a bit of oxygen and BAM! Light! Should you ever wonder if you actually observe bioluminescence or if someone just dropped a glow stick in the ocean, be on the lookout for neon blue, green, or even red sparkles in the sea. They're usually spread over a large area. This can even make the water look like glitter or a starry sky. You can thank squid, tiny crustaceans, and algae for this romantic atmosphere. Now, I've got another unusual phenomenon for you. How about a golden waterfall? I'm not kidding, it actually exists, and it's a natural phenomenon. To see it, you have to drive to Yosemite National Park to the Horsetail Fall. Make sure to plan your trip in winter or early spring. That's the only time during the year when you can see this awesome phenomenon. It doesn't need any scientific explanation. It's nothing more than sunlight at dusk hitting the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold, your choice. That's the reason why during this time of year, the Horsetail Fall is also named the Firefall. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is becoming less and less visible within the years, mostly because of drought and other issues connecting with the melting of snow. So, should you ever decide to visit, Keep an eye on the waterfall, since the effect is very brief. Ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? It's also called volcanic lightning. Apparently, specialists looking into the phenomenon have yet to fully grasp what it is. When a regular thunderstorm happens, particles with positive and negative charges collide, hence the giant spark we call lightning. It also makes a lot of noise, which you can recognize as thunder. But when a volcano is erupting, some of the volcanic ash particles get electrically charged, and while getting projected into the air with a huge force, they collide and cause electrical discharges. This whole process makes it look like there's lightning coming from the volcano itself. Imagine all that ash, gas, and smoke coming from the crater, and then add some electricity to the mix. It'll make the whole picture look really bizarre. No wonder this phenomenon is called the dirty thunderstorm. Now, how about clouds that look like waves? Those are called asperitas clouds, and they're actually quite close to the ground, unlike your regular day-to-day -day clouds. The name comes from the word aspero, which in Latin translates to rough or uneven. On rare occasion, you may spot such clouds when the weather is calm, but they're mostly associated with thunderstorms. These clouds appear during unstable atmospheric conditions, and surprisingly, they don't produce rain. Even though they do resemble dark storm-like clouds, they also create random patterns, tricking your eyes into thinking you're looking at the surface of the sea from under the water. Another impressive kind of cloud is called mammatus clouds. What makes them so special is a series of bulges emerging from the base of each cloud. 
One such cloud enters a level in the atmosphere where the wind direction changes. You can see these wave-like patterns in the sky. Australia is the place for you if you like surfing, but not all the waves you can catch there are made of water. Near a town called Hayden, there's a mysterious wave made out of rocks. This granite formation supposedly dates back to 2.63 billion years ago. That's way before dinosaurs started hanging around the planet. Standing at 49 feet high and 360 feet long, the wave was formed as a result of two processes, weathering and erosion. There's softer sediment at the base of the wave rock, which was chemically weathered by groundwater. Winds and rain did the rest of the job, causing the erosion of the rest of the formation. Its red, yellow, and gray stripes are made of iron hydroxide, carbonates, and other chemical compounds that were washed down by the rain. You've made it to Australia, so stick around a bit more. There's one more location here that seems unreal. You'll need to fly over this one, however, if you want the best picture. In the western part of the country, surrounded by green woodlands, there's a series of lakes. They're all a staggering shade of bright pink. Out of them all, the most famous is Lake Hillier, a 2,000-foot-long reservoir. It's surrounded by both sand and a forest of eucalyptus trees. This makes the cartoon-like hue of the lake stand out even more. One of the many theories explaining the color of these mysterious lakes is connected with algae. These algae appear to gather high levels of a substance called beta-carotene, which has a red-orange pigment in it. Another explanation involves haloarchaea. Those are microorganisms that sometimes look red. Even if you don't enjoy flying, the lakes are great for taking a swim. They're not toxic, even though they have loads of salt in them. This means you'll be able to stay afloat easily, and the water won't damage your swimsuit. During winter up north in Canada, a bizarre phenomenon happens at Lake Abraham in Alberta. Underneath the frozen surface, you can spot some weird objects that look like frozen jellyfish. It's definitely not the case, as these creepy formations are just frozen methane bubbles. Those are pockets of gas that were trapped underwater and got stuck there after the lake had frozen. They appear when leaves and grass fall into the water and bacteria digest them. This process transforms them into methane. This phenomenon is as beautiful and strange as it is dangerous. The pockets of methane can easily become highly flammable. When the temperatures rise during the spring, the ice melts and these bubbles start popping and fizzing. It's a spectacular sight to observe. Picture a lake filled with soda. Remember not to bring any source of fire. It can be very dangerous for visitors. You can check out these types of lakes all across Canada's Banff National Park. Nature often tends to make its own music. Just listen to the sound of crickets at night or the soothing noise of a waterfall. But in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there's a strange geological phenomenon which takes nature soundtracks to a completely different level. These are called the ringing rocks, and scientists still can't explain their unusual behavior. If you strike these rocks with a heavy object, like a hammer or another rock, the stones will make a ringing sound, as if they were hollow, but they're not. What makes the ringing rocks even more bizarre, apart from the mysterious sound they make, is that no animal wants to hang around there. Even though the rocks are surrounded by a thick forest, scientists haven't managed to trace any animal activity in the area yet. Even more striking is the fact that despite all the trees around the rocks, you won't find any leaves lying on the boulders. What makes these rocks so unappealing for both animals and vegetation is still up for debate. Hundreds of dinosaur species roamed our planet, and researchers give a name to a new type approximately every two weeks. It's not fair to stick to T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Spinosaurus, and other famous sauruses all the time. They've had their chance to shine in the movies and across the internet. So let's check out dinosaurs that no one talks about. First on our list is Taurosaurus. 
The special thing about this dinosaur is that it definitely had one of the largest skulls ever found. It was big because of this frill going from the back of the animal's skull and covering its neck. The frill wasn't there for protection. It was probably just to show off a bit. The bone in the frill was thin and full of holes. As you can see, it's very similar to Triceratops. There are still debates about whether these two are the same species. But more and more studies show that they were more like cousins. They were probably similar in size, but Taurosaurus had a longer head with big openings, as well as longer frill bones with a groove on top. It also had more pairs of horns on the back of the frill. Some like to call Taurosaurus a bull lizard. These fellows were plant eaters that may have lived in social groups. They existed at approximately the same age, but Taurosaurus somehow ended up on the less popular side of the family. Kentrosaurus was a small stegosaurus. It's one of the least cuddly dinosaurs of all time. Its long, thin spikes seemed to be a pretty good defense mechanism. Stegosaurus, on the other hand, had shorter, thicker spikes that were less likely to bend or snap when the animal used them. Now, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near Kentrosaurus, though. Its tail could swing in a big half circle and hit with a force strong enough to break a human skull. Any volunteers? No? Okay. One scientist used scans of the dino's fossils to make a computer model of its skeleton. The model showed that Kentrosaurus had a flexible neck. It must have been really useful for looking around to see if something interesting was going on or if there was any dangerous animals trying to sneak up. Kentrosaurus typically walked on all four legs with straight hind limbs. The computer model tells us it could spread its front legs out to its sides, too. Maybe it was a way to protect its belly during fights. Stegosauruses, in general, had tails that were like big weights at the back of their bodies. That's why their balance point was closer to their hips. That's also the reason why they could easily stand on their hind legs and swing their tails around. So most people haven't heard of heterodontosaurs, even though their fossils show that dinosaurs got feathers way back before we thought and in groups where we didn't expect it. In 2008, paleontologists identified the first known skull of a baby heterodontosaurus, which was less than 2 inches long, smaller than a tea bag. This baby dinosaur had relatively big eyes and a short snout compared to bigger ones of its kind. Now, what's really interesting is that some scientists used to think that heterodontosaurus's tusks, like those of modern warthogs, only appeared when they were fully grown. But it seems they had them from the early stages of their life. Heterodontosaurus had five fingers on each hand, two of which were opposable. It was a good tool, considering the animal probably ate both plants and meat. Humans have different types of teeth, some for biting, some for chewing, and also canines. But most reptiles have just one kind of teeth. Hedrodontosaurus was special because it had three different types of teeth. Small peg-like ones, big teeth resembling canines, and square-shaped teeth that did the cutting job. Scientists are not entirely sure how this creature used these different types of teeth. Maybe it was for digging up roots, breaking into termite nests, or even defending themselves against dangerous animals. Okay, say this name with me now. Sidacosaurus. She was quite a common dinosaur in its time, but she never still gained popularity. Scientists found out that when these dinosaurs were young, they probably crawled, considering they had longer arms and short legs. But as they got older, between 4 and 6 years old, their hind legs started growing much faster and became much longer than their front legs. So, later in life, they likely didn't move on all fours anymore, but walked on two legs. Inside the stomach of one of these creatures, scientists found pebbles. This shows the animals either had a hard time digesting what it ate, or it didn't chew its food very well. Its beak looks quite familiar. That's how it got its specific name, a parrot lizard. 
It was really strong, and some believe the creature used it to crack and open tough nuts and seeds before the pebbles in its stomach helped mash them up for digestion. These guys might have been good at swimming. They had broad feet, and the shape of their tail could have helped them move in the water relatively easily. Some scientists even believe they might have spent most of their life swimming in rivers and lakes. In 2004, researchers found something really sweet. 24 young parrot lizards huddled together. They were too big to be hatchlings, so it could be a bunch of teenagers who had left their nests and then formed a group where they could support one another and defend themselves better. But apparently, that plan didn't work out so well. Now, check this one out, Stygimola, or as they call it, Styx Demon. We're looking at a peaceful, plant-eating creature with bony spikes and knobs on its skull. Most scientists believe it was a younger form of this fellow, even though they used to think they were a separate species. Stygimoloch is smaller than its more popular cousin, but it's also more robust and has a pretty thick neck. This dinosaur, with small forelimbs and long hind legs 3 feet high, which is half as high as an average human. That doesn't sound dangerous in the world of giant and fierce dinosaurs, but the animal had a very thick skull roof. Maybe it wasn't the strongest tool to defend itself, but it probably helped in combat with rivals from its own species. They most likely headbutted to win the hearts of their chosen ones. But rivals from its own herd were a piece of cake compared to the predators that might have gone after it. After all, this dino lived at the same time as old T-Rex. Now, when someone tells you to picture a dinosaur, Chisosaurus would probably be the last thing coming to your mind. It looks as if you've put together pieces of random animals and tried to make your friends believe this truly was a real animal that once roamed the Earth. But it's actually a dino, with giant sharp claws on its forelimbs, a bulky body, and a long neck ending with a tiny head. Now, don't let the claws scare you, though. These creatures didn't go after other animals since they were herbivores. But these claws could protect the animal from intruders and predators. The full scientific name of this creature describes it as a giant sloth-like reptile from China. This animal was one of the biggest and oldest members of the group where it belonged, which lived around 115 million years ago. No, I wasn't around then. At first, it was hard to tell which animals were related to this weird-looking dinosaur. But in the 1990s, scientists made a conclusion that they were modified plant-eating theropods, which is similar to carnivorous dinos. They also most likely had feathers and small wings, like some sort of a very big turkey. (laughs) From tiny critters to colossal creatures, all animals are trying to escape from a wall of fire moving in their direction. The temperature is rising, and everything around starts catching fire. Soon, lots of animals and plants on Earth will cease to exist. This is the aftermath of a giant asteroid crashing into our planet. But what if dinosaurs had had critical thinking skills? They could have guessed what was going to happen, because this asteroid was visible a year before the impact. One year before the impact. With no city lights, all bright spots in the sky are stars. Some of them are planets reflecting the light coming from the sun, like Mars. But one of these dots is the asteroid. Later, it's going to be known as Chicxulub Impactor. It got this name because of the region of modern-day Mexico where it fell. Anyway, at this point, the asteroid looks like a star. It has the same brightness as Neptune. You could even have photographed it with a high-quality camera. If only dinosaurs had thumbs. The impactor is now passing through Jupiter's orbit. From this distance, Earth looks like a pale blue dot. One month before impact. The asteroid has become much brighter. It's now the most brilliant spot in the night sky after the moon. The asteroid crosses the orbit of Mars. Its tail, consisting of dust and gas, is getting longer and longer. It's now as long as two times the distance from Earth to the moon. One week before the impact. The intruder's tail is now five times the distance from the Earth to the Moon.
but the dinosaurs can appreciate its beauty. To them, it's just another bright dot in the night sky. If this asteroid were flying toward Earth right now, scientists could pinpoint the exact location of its impact within a mile. Then we would evacuate people from the impact area and avoid a major catastrophe. One day before the impact. The Chicxulub impactor now holds first place among the brightest objects in the sky. The light surrounding it, called the halo, seems even bigger than the moon itself. The asteroid is now passing through the moon's orbit. It looks like a bright spot that leaves an ashy trail behind it. One hour before the impact. The light from the Chicxulub impactor is brighter than the full moon, and its movement can be seen with the unaided eye. Nights on Earth aren't dark anymore. Only now, dinosaurs begin to feel anxious. All animals on Earth start to seek shelter. 10 minutes before the impact. The asteroid is now passing through Earth's orbit. Thousands of small fragments from its tail begin to fall on the planet. It looks like a meteor shower. So far, these fragments are too small. They all burn up in the atmosphere before reaching the surface of the planet. The asteroid is approaching South America. If someone was looking at it from Europe, it looked like a sunset. The bright dot of the Chicxulub impactor is falling behind the horizon. Two minutes before the impact. Dinosaurs can now easily see the asteroid shape. If they knew how to do it, they could even estimate its size. It's a bit more than 6 miles across, which means it's almost the size of Manhattan Island. And the giant's weight is 15 plus 15 zeros pounds. It's flying toward the Yucatan Peninsula at a mind-boggling 7.5 miles per second. At that speed, you could get from New York to Los Angeles in around 10 minutes, but you'd kind of burn up on the way. 10 seconds before the impact. The Chicxulub impactor is now approaching the ground. A few more feet and BAM! The night sky suddenly turns white. The flash is so bright that the sun is invisible at this point. The asteroid's entry causes a powerful blast that can be heard on the other side of the world. The huge asteroid begins to burn because of friction with the air. It heats up and splits into many pieces. These pieces shower on Earth. After a few seconds, the largest part of the meteorite hits the ground. Its mass and speed provide the Chicxulub impactor with an enormous amount of energy. In the next moment, a super-powerful explosion shakes the ground. The blast wave from the meteorite begins to spread out from the impact site. It rips out huge chunks of soil and trees and then pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The temperature of the blast wave is so high that everything around the impact site catches fire. The energy released during the collision also penetrates deep into the planet. This causes the strongest earthquakes in our planet's history. They, in turn, generate tsunami waves as high as the Empire State Building. Five minutes after the impact, the meteorite leaves behind a huge crater. It's as wide as Lake Huron and deep enough to fit inside two and a half Mount Everests. Dinosaurs are running around in panic. They try to evacuate toward North America, but most of them don't make it through unfamiliar swampy territories. Another danger is the ongoing meteor shower. Hundreds of tons of ash and debris rise into the air. Heated up by high temperatures, they fall to Earth in the form of liquid lava. Ash and smoke fill the atmosphere and block the sun's rays. Earth plunges into darkness. For several more weeks, our planet will be totally dark. Acid rains will fall on its surface nonstop. There was a lot of sulfur in underground deposits on the Yucatan Peninsula. The energy of the explosion evaporated all this sulfur. Now it's cooling in the air, gathering in clouds, and dripping to the ground. Most animals survive the impact, but the mass extinction continues for many more months. The collision has plunged Earth into darkness, and this has wiped out most of the plants that fed on sunlight. The plant-eating dinosaurs have lost their main food source and begin to disappear. But plant-eating dinosaurs are the main diet of meat-eaters. And now, dinosaurs like T. rex have nothing to eat. Soon, they go extinct too. In other words, it wasn't a meteorite that wiped out dinosaurs, but hunger and climate change. Meteorites of this size fall once every 100 million years. It means that such an event might happen again. Will humans manage to survive this disaster? These days, we can look out far into space. And the appearance of an asteroid the size of the Chicxulub impactor won't be a surprise to astronomers. In general, asteroids that are more than 460 feet across are considered potentially dangerous. 
Anyway, if we know about the approaching space body, we'll be able to build shelters filled with food and water supplies. Once the asteroid is close enough, we can wait for the impact and its consequences inside. But when people come back to the surface, they'll see cities and towns torn down. Our planet will look like a lifeless desert. That's why we need another alternative, which is to prevent the impact. Here, we have many options, depending on the size and material of the asteroid. According to NASA, the most effective way is a kinetic ram. We'll need to send a fairly large and heavy object, such as a spaceship, into space. When it approaches the asteroid, scientists will choose the perfect trajectory, and the ship will crash into the space body. A powerful collision will change the asteroid's course, making it fly past Earth. The further the space body is from our planet, the easier it'll be to send it away. Another option is a controlled explosion on the surface of the asteroid. Newton's first law of motion will help us here. It says if a body is moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will keep moving that way unless it is acted upon by a force. So if we make a big enough explosion or force, the asteroid will shift its trajectory. How much it moves depends on the amount of force applied to it. We can also blast the asteroid right from inside. In this case, there will be no need to change its trajectory. Instead, we'll try to turn one huge hunk of rock into a bunch of smaller fragments. They will burn up in the atmosphere and do no harm to our planet. Another way is a gravity tug. Every heavy object has its own gravitational force and gravitational field. Our goal will be to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and make it fly close to the intruder. The asteroid will attract the spaceship, but its engines will resist. As a result, the ship will slowly but surely pull the asteroid toward itself. This method will take much longer, but gradually, the trajectory of the asteroid will change and it won't crash into Earth. Hopefully. We can also use solar power. We can build a spaceship with a system of giant magnifying lenses. Then we'll send that station closer to the sun. When we spot an asteroid, we'll point the lens in its direction and focus the beam on the space body. The heat from the sun will cause the asteroid's material to evaporate. Eventually, this will make the intruder change its trajectory. 66 million years ago, I wasn't around then, a huge asteroid hit the Earth and triggered the mass extinction of almost all living creatures on the planet, including dinosaurs. Had the space object crashed somewhere else, some dinosaurs would have been able to survive and still live nowadays. According to some research, the asteroid had about 1 in 10 chances of wiping out the dinosaurs and other animals of that time. It was way more likely to just hit the ground without any strong destructive consequences. To understand how things could have turned out if the place of the collision had occurred elsewhere, we need to find out what happened that day and why the disaster turned out to be so devastating. This huge space rock fell into the coastal area of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This caused a chain reaction that triggered natural disasters around the world. The place the asteroid hit is called Chicxulub Crater. Now half of this area is underwater. The asteroid was about 7.5 miles in diameter and moving at a speed of 27,000 miles per hour. This rock, bigger than Everest, was rushing toward Earth faster than the speed of sound by almost 40 times. Wow! The energy released in the collision was as powerful as an explosion of about 10 billion atomic bombs. And the destructive force of the blast wave was just one of several disasters. The asteroid happened to fall in one of the worst possible places. And because of the way it fell, it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. Imagine you're jumping into the water like a professional athlete, vertically, leaving hardly any splashes behind. And now think of how much water splashes when you jump into the pool like a cannonball. So the asteroid landed the cannonball way. The second disaster the asteroid provoked was soot burning. A small part of the Earth's surface consists of rocks. Only a tiny percentage of that part was rich in oil and sulfur back then. The asteroid burned and lifted so much soot into the air that it would be enough to fill an indoor baseball stadium. According to research, 65 million years ago, only 13% of the surface of the entire planet could have contained the necessary amount of organic material for the formation of such a volume of soot. That's why this place was considered the worst. 
If the catastrophe had happened on the territory of the other 87%, then dinosaurs would have been alive today. A huge cloud of soot and carbon dioxide rose into the air and covered the sun. The soot turned the sky gray and partially blocked sunlight. This led to a quick drop in temperatures almost all over the planet. It seemed like Earth was inside a gray veil. Many plants and animals couldn't survive the cold snap. Trees began to wither because of the lack of sun. The photosynthesis process was disrupted. The cold and withering of trees led to another catastrophe – global famine. Herbivores couldn't survive because they lost almost all of their food. Plants, flowers, and trees didn't manage to get through the catastrophe. These destructions spread far beyond the asteroid impact site. Hot dust particles, asteroid chunks, and small pieces of rocks settled to the ground across the continent and caused large-scale forest fires. Burning trees threw even more soot into the air, which made the situation even worse. The huge asteroid brought heavy metals with an increased level of toxicity from space. The melting of these substances during the collision provoked firestorms. The asteroid didn't only hit continental land, but also water, which triggered a huge tsunami. But that's not the worst part. The seabed was filled with sulfate, and when the energy of the asteroid burned it, it provoked the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The acid cloud mixed with a cloud of soot and began to spread throughout the sky. Hot rock particles were falling to the ground like fire rain. An acid rain started because of sulfur. It lasted for almost several days and left no chance for the animals to survive. Acid rain made the water in rivers, lakes, and seas poison. The acid destroyed anything that couldn't burn. A part of the clouds went to wreck the land, and the other part, the ocean. This made the situation even worse, as sulfur droplets wiped out a huge amount of seaweed and phytoplankton. The ocean generates almost half of all oxygen reserves on our planet. Those days, the sea creatures living in its upper parts were destroyed. It wasn't the blast wave, but lack of sun, acid, darkness, and cold that became the main reasons for the extinction of dinosaurs. But even when some lizards escaped from fires and sulfur, they met the sea element. The asteroid impact caused large-scale tsunamis across the planet. The very first wave was around one mile in height. That's almost three times higher than the Empire State Building. Billions of gallons of water were moving at 90 miles per hour. A wave this strong could easily destroy half of New York today. The meteorite created a series of waves 52 feet high. Massive walls of water the size of five-story buildings collapsed on the shore and demolished everything in their path. Lack of sunlight, temperature drop, acid and fire rains, reduced oxygen production, forest fires, giant tsunamis, and the explosive wave with the power of a billion atomic bombs – all this reduced the biological diversity of Earth by 75%. Yeah, that'll change your climate for sure. Giant asteroids used to hit Earth before, but they never caused such disasters all over the planet. What if this asteroid had fallen into another place, say a forest, far from water and mountainous terrain? This would have caused severe fires. A huge black cloud of ash would have risen into the sky and obscured the sun. But it would have unlikely generated acid or fire rains. Most of the species of the planet could have survived this catastrophe. What if the meteorite had fallen somewhere among the ice and snow? This would have provoked a rapid increase in temperature across the planet. Huge tsunamis would have sunk big tracts of land. However, ash and sulfur dioxide wouldn't have filled the sky. Acid rain wouldn't have hit the ocean. Many marine creatures could have survived and lived to this day. And dinosaurs, far from the oceans, wouldn't have noticed the meteorite fall at all. Probably the most terrible events would have occurred if a meteorite had fallen on an active volcano. This would have triggered the largest lava release in history. Destructive earthquakes would have begun, and the whole sky would have been covered with volcanic ash. What if the meteorite had hit some desert? It would have melted billions of tons of sand and turned it into glass. Just imagine glass dunes that heat our planet even more. And we could dig up the well-preserved remains of ancient lizards out of the glass. Anyway, there were many different possible catastrophic scenarios. And the worst of them came true for the dinosaurs. They are unlikely to return. Although, perhaps, they can be reborn. 
Scientists were inspired by an idea from a famous Hollywood movie. They wanted to find a mosquito that got stuck in amber. They would extract dinosaur DNA from it. But there was a problem with this. The oldest DNA sample they managed to find was 1 million years old. Dinosaurs were extinct about 66 million years ago. Besides, DNA is a very fragile thing. The probability that it could have been preserved intact somewhere for so long is very small. So, instead of searching for this ancient dinosaur DNA, scientists decided to take DNA from the closest ancestors of these lizards, birds. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaur paws could have turned into wings and elongated mouths could have become beaks. Pelicans are very similar to pterodactyls, ostriches resemble velociraptors, and chickens are very much like T-Rex. Okay, let's just stop and imagine for a moment a chicken the size of a T-Rex. Hey, you! You want a piece of me? Now, the common chicken is recognized as the closest relative of the huge lizard. Remove the plumage from it, cover it with scales, give a toothy mouth instead of a beak, and attach a long tail. And you get a real, mini Tyrannosaurus rex by body structure and movement. Deep in its DNA, there are similar genes that formidable predators have. With the help of genetic engineering, scientists plan to play with its DNA and try to reverse the evolution. Which means breeding dinosaurs can become a reality. Well, that could come back to bite you.